Hi, welcome to Full Moon Podcast, a production of Elisha Bones Ministry, bringing you the truth of eschatology. I'm your host, Stephen Woodson. I hope you'll be able to join us Sunday night at 7 o'clock Central Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Time to discuss all things concerning the end of days. Or you can listen to your favorite podcast source at any time. But we will attempt for the first time this Saturday, Sunday night, to go live. Um, So uh, everybody is invited to come and try to listen. So for the next 45 minutes right now, be ready to listen and take heart to the things that are said. And hopefully we'll answer your questions about the end of days. So in tonight's episode, we will be dealing with the rough outline of the book of Revelation, beginning on part two with Revelation 12. Now, when we last left off, we were talking about the uh, God being king over all the earth, the Lord being king. And the resurrection where everyone is raised to rule with him on earth for a thousand years. Now, in Revelation 12, we get, we we kind of turn a corner. There's no more seven seals judgment they're not talking about. But they, they, he gets a picture, a vision of of basically of history of what has been, what is now, and what will be in, in the very general kind of a sense. So in Revelation 12, The focus now turns to Satan, and a short history lesson is given about Satan's motives. Uh, Symbolically, it describes the birth of Christ and Satan's desire to kill him, but instead, he is taken to heaven in his ascension. So Israel then is protected in the wilderness for, again, 42 months, the same time as the two witnesses of chapter 11. Meaning, through all of this, Israel is untouched by the beast. Um, In verses 7 to 12, it speaks to the authority of the church to cast Satan out, of power, and he's no longer the ruler of this world or the prince of the air, through Christ's death and resurrection, of course. So the pursuit then changes from the church to Israel. And when that again fails, he again turns to the church. This is all written from the perspective of Satan, of history, since the birth of Christ, his ascension, until the point of the Great Tribulation. Again, it's just an overview. Again, I'm not seeking to write a commentary on every little point of symbolism, but to give the big picture of what Revelation is basically about. So that is chapter 12. Revelation 13. Now, because Satan is thrown down, Revelation 13 now describes his rise of power through the beast and the false prophet as a means to rage war on the church. Now, the beast sets up a whole worldwide system and a religious system of worship that includes a false prophet to perform signs and wonders to fool the people. So the mark of the beast is that I have been identification with this system and when it comes christians will know without a doubt there's no more wondering who the man is what the mark is is it a computer is it this is it the vaccine mandate whatever all the speculative nonsense has got to come to an end um especially all the stuff that's gone on for the last 80 years so all of this happens the last three years and it is the true tribulation period that we are talking about uh people you'll know it You will know it. You will know it. That's 13. 14. Revelation 14 begins with one of the most misunderstood passages on all of Revelation. All of Revelation. Simply noted is a group of people are called the first fruit to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Now the number of 144,000 is is 12 times 12, indicating to the number of the tribes of Israel who were saved. My personal opinion, now this is my personal opinion, nobody else's. Well, I mean, other people think the same thing, but I don't try to offer too much of my first opinions and stuff like this, but this one is difficult. Um, the first fruits, the first of those were, that are taken to heaven is what I believe. I believe they are the Old Testament state saints who stand with them. Or it could mean they are the first 144,000 martyrs of the beast of of Israel, but I kind of doubt that one. I I lean more towards this is the first of those that were resurrected when Jesus ascended. 
Now, in the message of the three angels, the first is for people to be faithful, for the hour of judgment has come. That's a call for the Christians to be faithful. The second angel speaks to the destruction of the beast in his kingdom who killed the saints. And the third angel is a warning to the saints not to take the mark or worship the beast. Don't do it, people. Don't compromise. Don't think you can do it and pretend or anything else. It says, do not do it. So this chapter concludes with the image of God's wrath being poured out on the beast and on his kingdom in which the beast rules from a city of power and influence. In one sense... Like New York, where all the world commerce happens there, World Trade Center, um, all the things happen there. The United Nations, I mean, New York is kind of a hub. I'm not saying and suggesting that New York is the city of the beast and the king, but I would not rule it out entirely. But, you know, we simply will not know until it's time come. But that's kind of the image that you get, that the beast rules from a city like this over the nations. And that is the description in Revelations 18 even. But now we turn to the seven bowls. Um, these are the specific judgments now against the beast and for what he has done to the church. The seven bowls are the last judgments that completes the wrath of God against the ungodly. And the image of the singing, the song of Moses, represents the idea that these judgments, unlike the first, which was against all mankind for their sin, this judgment is against the beast and false prophet's kingdom who used the judgments to attack and kill his people. Now, this is the reason for the seven bowls of judgment. Number one, in the first bowl, bowl, yeah, bowl, saying it right, sores break out on the people who have the mark. In the second, the seed becomes poisoned and foul so that every living thing in them dies. We're talking about the whales, the dolphins, all the fish, they're gone. Uh, they die. Uh, in the third, the fresh water becomes poisoned. Hmm. Fresh water becomes poisoned again. In the fifth, they experience extreme global warming. It gets very hot, people. It's going to get very hot. And they curse God because of the heat. Uh, plants and things cannot grow very well. So again, still, you're having issues. In the fifth, their kingdom is plunged into darkness. Meaning the lights go out. Wow. And in the sixth, the Euphrates River dries up. Allowing for the massive army to come without barriers and they gather in the valley of Megiddo. The idea is, is that in this, what happens is that the beast turns on, because of all these judgment that's happening, being plunged into darkness, the lights going out, all of this stuff, the beast separates himself from this kingdom and turns on the, the harlot, uh, this, this false church, this false kingdom, and uh, gathers his own people, gathers this army, and they gather in the Valley of Megiddo because they're going to blame, of course, Israel and the two witnesses who have been calling out these judgments against people. So they're going to gather this armor, uh, army against Israel. So in the seventh bowl, God declares, it's done. That's done. The armies have gathered against Israel and the earthquake is described in just about every second coming passage of the Old Testament prophecy. Uh, Revelation, hailstones falls on these armies. We got trouble. And in Revelation 17, we take a pause for the description or explanation of who the beast is and what he is and why the judgments come upon them. So, going into Revelation 18, 17, 18, in a nutshell, the prostitute is a city or nation that worked with, supported, and endorsed the beast and is one world kingdom. The beast will come to hate this nation or people and cause her to be burnt with fire. In Revelation 18, the chapter describes the mourning that takes place over her destruction by the rest of the world. The beast has separated himself from this kingdom and has now joined forces with others that raise the armies that will then gather in the Valley of Megiddo. This is the seventh bowl. Megiddo is a lo valley located northwest of Jerusalem, as I said, about 50 miles. It is not an army surrounding Jerusalem. They're gathering in the Valley of Megiddo. Revelation begins with the marriage supper of the Lamb, 19, excuse me, begins with the marriage supper of the Lamb. The imagery of a wedding is often used many times through scriptures. And, uh oh, I got pulled out of my place. Okay. I got to go back and find it. 
Oh, there it is. Okay. Now, it begins with the marriage of, of the wedding. And I think this is important to explain this imagery. In a Jewish wedding, the marriage was arranged. And the day of the wedding, family members would go to the house of the bride and family members of the groom to his house, two separate houses. And they celebrate. Hence, in Matthew 25, while the virgins waited for the bridegroom to come, right? Eventually, the groom would make his way to the bride's home. Word would be received he is coming, and the family would come out of the house and meet him as he came in. Then everyone would go inside and celebrate. So this is the terminology of the rapture, the picture being painted in Revelation 19. The bridegroom has come, and they come out of the houses to meet him on the path into the house, and they would all enter together. It's talking about the bridegroom is coming. Wow. Trying to do something here. And in the imagery of the second coming, much like the events of Palm Sunday, those who are called to the marriage are the ones who meet him in the air. This is the marriage of the Lamb with his saints. He then comes to earth in Jerusalem. Revelation 19 states that the armies of the nations gather to prepare for battle against him and the rider and the white horse. So the armies of heaven and the king of kings comes out to meet the army and destroys it to the last man. The beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire alive. Alive. This is literal language. You can throw people alive into something, right? Christ then sets up his throne in Jerusalem to rule over the nations with the rod of iron. Then everyone who has survived of the nations, according to Zechariah 14, 16, that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of Booth. A thousand years. Now, in chapter 20, it begins with the describing the literal imprisonment of Satan, who started the whole problem of the beast in the first place. The rest of the chapter will be described later and dealt with in a response to the different views. So this might seem short, uh, but I just want to quickly go over what Revelation is about. And so the first thing is Satan is thrown into prison. John sees the ones who were killed in the tribulation, and they come to life and rule and reign with him over a restored kingdom of Israel, with Jesus sitting on the throne of his father David for a thousand years. Now, this could be a literal a thousand years, or it could represent a long time, literal long time. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's a perfect time period where Christ is ruling on earth. So at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released to seize many nations to rebel against him. They gather for a second time, not learning their lesson, obviously. And this is when God calls it quits. Fire comes down and burns up the whole earth while the seas and the grave give up their bodies of all people who have ever lived. The just and the unjust stand before the throne and the wink the king enters, every knee will bow. The great white judgment takes place where the just are rewarded and the unjust are given a chance to explain themselves. They are judged by their deeds and what they did, as according to what's written in the books. In the end, the unjust are thrown into the lake of fire where Satan was thrown in first. The new heavens and earth in Revelations 21-22 follows after. Remember, the earth has been burnt up. It has been made uh, brand new. It is redesigned, recreated to make and look as if it was brand new. We're not talking about it being completely burned up and destroyed and, and nothing's left of it. We're talking about it being reshaped and refashioned. Just as water destroyed the t uh, earth in those days, so fire destroys the earth in these days. So in Revelation 21, we see a picture that begins with the New Jerusalem, the city of God coming down out of heaven and its perfect description. The earth has been made to be like new and it's not destroyed and burned up as we said, right? Uh, the city of God then descends out of heaven and man and God now live face to face where there is nothing of the old life remaining. He says he makes all things new. The curse of the garden in Genesis 3 is gone. There is no more sickness, pain, disease, and certainly no more death. So man then faces eternity with God while the unjust remain outside and never participate in the fruits of a glorious life in Christ. What God has in store for us has never entered the imagination of man. 
So again, this was never meant to be a thorough understanding of every symbolic statement, but to give a chronology of the last days and to demonstrate the literal nature of the events described in the book through metaphorical and allegorical language. Now, in this next section, um, what I want to do is go to Zechariah 12 and 14. These are second coming prophecies, and you, as I read through, you'll understand why. So I will we'll start with Zechariah 12. Um, starting in verse 2. Of course, the first line is the introduction concerning Israel, an oracle, prophecy, about that. And it says, Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. So this is talking about all of Israel. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. The imagery is, is that there are people um, that are going to come against Jerusalem. But because they come against it, just like Babylon was judged and got in trouble for doing it, even though God used him, he still says, hey, I used you, but man, you shouldn't have done that. And here's your your just reward for what you did. And uh, eventually uh, the kingdom of Babylon fell. Now all who lift it will surely hurt themselves. So all these nations that come against will hurt themselves. And all the nations of the earth will gather against it. Now, we are talking about, um, in 14, we'll see the same thing. We're talking about 70 AD. All the nations of earth will gather against it. We're not talking about um, the end of the world. And I'll, I'll explain why. It says, On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and his rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the people with blindness. So, there's a part of where he keeps Judah alive. He doesn't mm -hmm. strike it down. Um, but these nations that came against it to begin with, now God turns on them. It says in verse 5, Then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, The inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength to the Lord of hosts, their God. Now, if there's going to be a day... A staggering of the people and something that and a, a siege against Jerusalem. The siege of Jerusalem in verse two. Uh, this happened in seventy A.D. Half the people were taken and half of them destroyed. But here, and all of Jerusalem was destroyed. But here in verse five it says, "The clans of Jews shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength to the Lord of hosts, their God." I'm sorry, back in 70 AD, the inhabitants did not have strength for the Lord God. They were decimated by the Lord God. So on this day that he comes, that this happens, this other day of judgment from God against the kingdom that came against, and the nations and the peoples that came against Jerusalem, it says in verse 6, On that day I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood. What happens? You put something hot in the middle of a bunch of wood, it catches fire and it spreads. Like a flaming torch among the sheaves, it sparks a fire that spreads everywhere. And they should devour, be devoured to the right and to the left, all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. So the idea is that Jerusalem will exist. It will, in this days, in this time period, uh, will exist. It's it, doesn't cease to and it implies that there was a ceasing so we know that after 70 AD Jerusalem over over all these years was never the kingdom of Israel ever again Jerusalem was never the capital again um, it was always controlled by other nations and never all kinds of different things all these 2,000 years until 1948 but it says on this day that there that Christ uh, God comes in protection of it he gives strength to the Lord of the hosts through it the inhabitants. So, in verse 7, And the Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. They will be equally put together. They are brought together. Ezekiel 32 talks about them coming together a second time. So on that day, 
the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Were they protected in 70 AD? No. So this cannot be talking about it. You cannot say that half the city was destroyed, half the people went into exile, half the people were became slaves and killed, and say, hey, the inhabitants of Jerusalem were protected. I'm sorry, you can't do that. It's a contradiction. So that the it goes on to say in verse 8, So the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God. The house of David, Christ we're talking about. Like the angel Lord going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Revelations 19, remember the armies, Valley Megiddo. This is where they are all destroyed. Then I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. So when they look on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. Who they have pierced. Yes, they looked on him. They pierced in the Gospels when he died. And then Revelations, of course, he talks about him being pierced. They will mourn for him. Um, and according to Revelations, uh, excuse me, Romans 11. Here's what I think is coming to this. Please of mercy. I believe that when Christ comes and he's revealed from heaven, that the Jewish people all across the world are going to recognize who this is. That it is Jesus who comes down from heaven. It is the same one that they killed 2,000 years ago, who they pierced, and they're going to mourn as the ones who mourned for Bethlehem over their firstborn, or of over Moses when he was born, the firstborn that were killed. The idea is, is the same. There is going to be weeping because they're going to look at this son that they killed, and they come to repentance. A pleas for mercy and grace. And I believe in that way, all of Israel will be saved as one when they see him. And I think that is the great grace of God. On that day, the morning of Jerusalem will be as great as the morning of Hadar Riman in the plain of Megiddo. See, he comes back to that, doesn't he? Megiddo. The land shall mourn each family by itself. Um, and it goes on to talk about the families that are going to mourn. So there is a representation there in the language that all of Israel, the 144,000 that we saw in Revelation, are the ones who will be brought out and saved. Now, in the parallel passage of Zechariah 14, it's almost the exact idea, but with more information, a little bit more detail. So let's look at it. It says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoils taken from you will be divided in your midst. For Divided in your midst. Spoils taken from you. Uh, we're talking about Israel. Jerusalem being destroyed. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And this is what happened with the Roman army. And this, and it has overtones of, of what goes on in Revelation. But again, this cannot be Revelations. There's nowhere in there where the city is being destroyed. And remember the last verse, it says, the inhabitants will be protected. So it can't be talking about Revelations. There's no place in Revelation where it talks about Israel or Jerusalem being destroyed. Um, it says, the, gather, the nations will gather against Jerusalem in battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered. Uh, oh, comment. If you uh, read the annals of uh, uh, Tacitus and the armies that gathered on Jerusalem, you will understand there was there was a part of the Roman army where German conscripts and several other nations were part of that army that came. In other words, people that were conquered, the Germans that were conquered, became part of their army as a way to become citizens in the Roman Empire, to prove their loyalty, all the items of different reasons. But as part of the army, you were always fed and taken care of. So, And the Roman army was always made up of the people that they... Uh, conquered so those are the nations that come against jerusalem all these nations and it says half the city shall go out into exile which we know did in 70 a.d but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city so some people did remain and it does talk about those that scattered and hid um but half the city shall go out into exile and the other half good part were killed and some remained then then because all that has happened, the Lord will go out and fight against those nations 
as when he fights on a day of battle. Now, when God fights on a day of battle, what does he do? He comes with his armies and he destroys those armies. That's that's how he wins. He When he fights on a day of battle, he wins. God never loses. So verse 4, on that day, when he comes out to fight against those nations, on a day of battle, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. There you go, folks. There's your earthquake. There's Jesus in Acts 1 coming back down and standing physically, literally, on the Mount of Olives, just as he said he would. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquakes in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with them. Now Paul repeats this and quotes this in uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 at the end of the verse. His coming with all of his saints. And then of course in Revelations 19 it's the same thing. Jesus is coming with all of his saints as his army. So on that day that he comes, there will be no light, cold, or frost. There, It will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but evening time there shall be light. So when he comes, man, he's going to upset the whole thing and everybody's going to know. Um, these are physical manifestations of his presence. On the day, living water shall flow out of from Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people like to say, living waters, that's the church, you know. And, and no, when I, I, I look at that, to be consistent, we're talking about literal dis, um, descriptions here. That day, living waters. So you have an earthquake, living waters, fresh waters. Remember, this is in contrast to the bitter waters that have been happening. But now, all of a sudden, he comes um, and living waters is being poured out from Jerusalem. And so, here's Jerusalem, the only one that's got... Good, clean water. And people are going to want to come, of course, because of that. Half of that to the Eastern Sea and the other half to the Western Sea. So what's the Eastern Western? Western Sea is the Baltic Sea. Eastern, of course, would be right across there is the Sea of Galilee. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And um, that water continues to flow. It's not going to stop. It shall continue in summer and as in winter. There again, it's not describing the world being burnt up and destroyed and, and instantly gone because he returns. It says that it continues, that water continues in summer as in winter. It never stops flowing, and it continues on over a long period of time. Then verse 9, And the Lord will be king over the earth. On that day the Lord will be one and his name one. That means, and, and that's understood, that Jesus, when he comes back, he will be king over the earth. He's the ruler. He's the one world government. He's the one who takes control. So the whole land shall be turned into the plains from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of its former gate, to the corner gate, and from the Tower of Hanel to the king's wine presses. Now, this is a description of Jerusalem in those days. But the idea is, of course, is that Jerusalem sits on seven hills. Um, and so this is all inclusive of, of this whole area. Of that is Jerusalem. It will be remain a lot on top of its hills. While everything else goes flat, it says that mountains will be removed and, and uh, tumbled down and torn down because of this great earthquake. And it's going to be some kind of earthquake to do that. And so Israel, or uh, Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, for there never shall again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. Here's the idea, people. If 70 AD was a, a pronouncement of, or a decree of utter destruction that came from Jesus and came from Daniel, then this time here is going to dwell in security from this time forward. Do you follow? There's no more anybody coming after it. There is no decree that it should ever be destroyed after 70 AD. It shall be inhabited and when was it inhabited by Israel? 70 AD up till 48 AD. 48 is when it became a city, a, a nation. For there shall never again be a decree of utter description. The last one is 70 AD. There's never going to be another one of it. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. And this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. 
Their flesh will rot while they are standing in their feet. And their eyes will rot in their sockets. And their tongues will rot in their mouths. I, I, I know. I can't help but this. I can't help. I can't help it. But that is so descriptive of a nuclear bomb, right? <laughs> okay. I don't think the nuclear bomb is going to come in Megiddo. I don't think so. But I think uh, it, it's something else that's going to happen there. But it says that the Lord will strike all these people that wage war against her and with their flesh will rot. It'll be something that will come against them because of God. Then, 13, and on that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall on them, all these nations and all these people that came against them, so that each will seize the hand of another, and the hand of the one will be raised against the hand. They will start fighting each other, so that even Judah will fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, and garments in great abundance. And that means the spoils of war. Um, everything that they came through will become Israel's, become Jerusalem's. Um, but they will fight among each other. And again, again, uh, the best one of the best scenarios that we were seeing in, in the movies is the uh, Lord of the Rings, the return of the king, when Aragon comes off that boat and all those dead people come with him. Now, of course, we're not going to be that ugly, but all these people come and that's that army and it wipes out this other army. And so that's basically the idea that even Tolkien, who was a Christian, uh, implemented into his, his works there. So, a plague like this a plague shall fall on the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and whatever beasts may be in those camps. So, there's going to be plagues that fall on them, and they're just going to be completely put into a disarray. Then everyone, this is key verse 16, then everyone who survives of the nations that have come against them shall go up year after year to worship the king. People, it's just the armies that are destroyed, not the people from the other nations. It's only the armies that are destroyed. The ones who survive of the nations will come to Jerusalem. Get that? They have to come to it. They're not there being destroyed. They come to it. Year after year to worship the king. Why are they worshiping the king? Because that's where he's at. There's no description here where Jesus comes and feet stand and then he goes back up. There's no description in here about that. It never happens. So he is here on earth. The Feast of Booth has to do with fellowship. People will come and fellowship with, with God. And if anybody of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king year after year, there will be no rain on them. Well, Christians are going to want to come, right? So who would want not want to? I'm Christian. So they're the survivors of the nation. doesn't mean that they're Christians. Uh, but here they are going to be ruled by Christ from Jerusalem. Uh, and if they don't do it, they're going to get punishment and uh, things going on. Um, against them if they don't. So this is, and it ends with this. They shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts that day. So it just changes everything. Now, I I, I got a few minutes here, and I want to go to something. Um, Isaiah. I believe it is 9 or 19. 19. Uh, Isaiah. I'm going to my computer here, of course, and bringing it up. Now, in Isaiah 19, it begins with, this is an oracle or prophecy concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt in judgment, right? The idols will tremble. Uh, he'll stir up the Egyptians against the Egyptians. They will fight their neighbors. And... I will give over the Egyptians to the hand of a man, hard master. This first king will rule over them, declares the Lord God of hosts. Uh, the waters in the sea will be dried up, and the river will be dried up and parched, and its canals will become foul. And the branches of Egypt's Nile will diminish and dry up. Reeds and rushes will rot away. Has this happened in his... No, this has not happened. This is a future prophecy. Then there will be... Bare places by the Nile, on the brink of the Nile. And all that is sown by the Nile will be parched. It will be driven away and there will be no more. The fishermen will mourn and lament. All who cast a hook in the Nile, they will be languish, who spreads nets in the water. The workers in comb flocks will be in despair and the weavers of white cotton. <laughs> that's kind of funny, the weavers of white cotton. Remember that's very popular? Uh, Mike Liddell, he, he's teaching what? Egyptian cotton. Remember how famous Egyptian cotton is? And it, here it is. He's going to say, the weavers of white cotton, um, it's not going to happen. It'll be crushed. It'll just be stopped up. Those who are the pillars of the land will be crushed, and all who work for pay will be grieved. The princes of his own are utterly foolish. 
The counselor at Farrell gets stupid counsel. And uh, she's put into quite a bad place. The Lord has mingled within her spirit of confusion. They will make Egypt stagger in all its deeds as a drunken man standards in his vomit. And there will be nothing for Egypt that had her tail, palm branch or reed, may do. But there's a turn in verse 16 of Isaiah 19. In that day, the Egyptians will be like women and tremble with fear before the hand of the Lord of hosts shakes over them. And the land of Judah will become a terror to the Egyptians. And everyone to whom it is mentioned will fear because the purpose of the Lord has purposed against them. In that day, there, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan. What's the language of Canaan? Hebrew? And swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. And all of these will be called the city of destruction. Interesting. How do you reconcile it being called a city of Canaan, swearing allegiance to the Lord, but yet called the city of destruction? I'm just throwing this out there, people. You got to kind of put it together yourself. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its borders. And it will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, he will send them a savior and a defender and deliver them. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and will worship and sacrifice an offering. And they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. Very interesting prophecy, isn't it? When did this happen in time? Has it happened in time? I don't see it. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. And they will return to the Lord. And he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. Do you not hear that? Okay, why, why is there a return? Uh, Egypt, remember during the time of Joseph, there was a time there when Egypt actually did follow the Lord because of Joseph. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Highway, I love it. A road from Egypt to Assyria. And Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria. And a blessing in the midst of the earth. Whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, in Israel, my inheritance. Wow, what an interesting prophecy in Isaiah 19 that has yet to be fulfilled. Um, and why do I bring this up? Uh, very simply, in one sense, because full prayers say that all prophets have been fulfilled, but we look at the nature of, of what it's saying here, and there will be five cities in the land. This is literal language, even though it is Old Testament prophecy. And why do we know that there is such literal prophecies in the Old Testament. Well, remember, it prophesied about Jesus. Not a bone of him was be broken. He was born of a virgin, come from the city of Bethlehem. So we know all the way through this prophecy is literal and true things. The same thing is true about the book of Revelations. It describes things using apocalyptic language to describe real events and real things. So as we've gone over that uh, book, and then we've gone over now the uh, Zechariah 12 and 14. We've shown that those are two second coming prophecies in which on the day he comes, Israel will exist. There is no more decree of judgment against her. And God will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So when we go to Revelation, how can it say that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed? One, there's no prophecies that says that Jerusalem has to be destroyed again. If God is bringing it back together again and giving her time to be repent, then there's no sense that, that it needs to be judged again as a nation. If he judges nation, uh, Israel for what he's doing, then he, yeah, think about the judgment that needs to come on America uh, for her sin. Uh, Israel right now is a, a saint compared to us. And I mean that literally. Um, I know some people would like to argue about, well, I'm not even go there. Um, not at this point anyway. So that's, that's kind of Zechariah 12 and 14, 7 coming and uh, the prophecies that are going on. 
Okay, I will conclude this podcast just a couple of minutes short. Um, thank you guys for listening. And again, if I have inspired any questions, feel free on my YouTube channel or any other place to comment, ask questions, go to my Facebook page, and uh, give listen. Thank you guys, and have a good day.